Victory exists for one purpose, to proclaim the life-changing power of Jesus Christ and to make fully devoted followers of him. It's why every brick in this building is in place. It's why every plank of wood, it's every square foot of carpet, every light bulb, every roof, every shingle on the roof is so that we can climb to the rooftops and announce that Jesus Christ is Lord and to proclaim the life-changing power of Jesus. Every program that we offer, every message that is preached, every song that is sung, every time we open up the doors of this building and, and invite people to come in, every time we leave the doors of this building to go out into our community, it is to proclaim the life-changing power of Jesus. It's why I get up every morning. It's why I'm right here. Of all the places I could be on this particular morning, of all the things I could be doing, it's to proclaim this life-changing power of Jesus. And, to make, and the second part of that is to make fully devoted followers of him, which simply means there are no half measures in this. There's no halfway. There's no fence sitting. There's no having one leg in the boat and the other leg in the water. There's no sitting on the fence. All the way in, full throttle discipleship to Jesus Christ. And that's, we're, not, we're not just gathering together to try to build the biggest church that we can build. We're trying to build the biggest disciples that we can build, the biggest Christians that we can build, because that is the deep need of your soul. That's the deep need of our community. That's what the world really needs. And so we are here for one singular purpose, to proclaim the life-changing power of Jesus, that if you take hold of this truth, if you take hold of this gospel, if you let it take hold of you, nothing will be the same. And we've been on a journey for the last 40 days to the cross. And these seven Sundays leading up to, to Easter, we've been in this journey to the cross, looking at the seven festivals that the Jews would have practiced and still practice to this day, the seven festivals that Jesus would have practiced every year of his life and practice in the final year of his life in his own journey to the cross. And it's all been leading to this one particular festival. There is one particular festival that has been kind of highlighted and circled in my calendar as we've been going through this, this festival and it, through this series. And this is the one we've been pointing to, which is especially meaningful in Jesus' own journey to the cross and in helping us to understand what the cross really means for us as Christians and believers. So before we get into it this morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 22. But before we get into it, I want to say a warm good morning to our friends over at Victor Almira. And I understand there's some fresh paint over there. Maybe you get the benefit of some paint fumes ascending into worship over there this morning. I think there's some more work to be done. They just did some murals down in the kids' area to make that bright and fresh and cheery for the kids. And uh, if you I think it, they did it kind of a paint-by-numbers approach, so if you have paint, painting skills or if you don't have painting skills, they could use some help to finish those up in the next week. And I want to welcome especially those who are joining us online. And uh, last week I shared... I kind of doubled down our commitment to, to streaming our services online every week, and I've been overwhelmed with the messages I've received, the people who've told me their own unique stories about needing to watch online for health reasons or in a crisis or just how much it means to them when they're traveling that they can stay connected to, to their home church online. This morning, I know I've got friends who are watching, people I love dearly who are watching online, and so a very warm good morning to all of you who are joining us online this morning. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 22 this morning, as I said, but before we get into it, I want to pray for us and pray for our hearts as we listen to God's word. And I want to pray in particular uh, some words from the great hymn writer, Fanny Crosby. Would you pray with me? Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before us. Help us walk from day to day with its shadow over us. In the cross, be our glory forever till our ransomed souls shall find rest beyond the river. Lord, as we reflect on your sufferings, would you keep the shadow of the cross on us and help us to feel your, your presence in this place as we open your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke 22, beginning of verse 7, this is what it says. Then the day of the unleavened bread came on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now, this is, we're down to the last two of these major festivals that, that Jesus celebrated throughout his life that the Jews still celebrate. And we're down to the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. These are originally intended to be two separate festivals. Passover is a day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven day festival. And because of that, they're kind of inextricably linked together in practice and in the hearts of of Jewish people around the world. They're kind of linked together the way that Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday are linked together for us, the way that 
Christmas Day and New Year's Day are kind of bookends of one whole week. The way that the Buffalo Bills are linked with disappointment for so many of us, <laughs> forever and ever, amen, it seems. This, these two holidays, you can't quite separate them. They're the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. And Jesus is now gathering in this moment with his disciples, joining with them, telling Peter and John, go make preparations for the Passover supper. And they're beginning to celebrate this meal. And there's six things I want to share with you this morning about this, the pure significance of this meal when it comes to the story of Jesus, of his life, of his mission, and why he came. And the first is this. Passover is mentioned in 11 out of 21 chapters in John's Gospel. 11 out of 21 chapters in John's Gospel, this, this, this festival Passover is mentioned it's in John chapter 2 and John chapter 6. And 11 through 19 it's contained, it's all against the backdrop of the Passover festival. Matthew, Mark, and Luke only mention it, uh, one occurrence of the Passover. John describes three different occasions in the ministry of Jesus when he's observing the Passover. So for John and for the, the apostles, it's very clear this is a significant, significant festival. Throughout this whole series, I've said how these seven festivals are uh, uh, contained, are the backdrop of 75% of John's gospel and now you can see that the Passover is a big, ma big, major, major part of that, which leads to number two, that the Passover was a deliberate choice for the timing of the crucifixion. And he writes it this way. He says, all four Gospels make, one, make clear one vital point, that Jesus chose Passover to go to Jerusalem and confront the temple establishment. That this was not an oops or a neat coincidence. He didn't walk into Jerusalem and say, oh, it's Passover. Didn't we just celebrate Passover? It seems like Passover is just like we just did that. No, he walked into Jerusalem knowing full well that this Passover was happening, and it was a choice. It was a deliberate signal that, that this Passover was going to, to help explain his death, help explain his crucifixion, and the symbolism of Passover was going to overlap so interestingly with his death on the cross, which leads to number three. Passover is a key for understanding the cross of Christ. And T. Wright again says that Jesus seems to have thought Jesus seems to have believed that all the symbolism of Passover, all the symbolism around this, this event in Exodus chapter 12 and this, this yearly celebration, this annual celebration, that the, the, the ingredients of Passover would help generations of Christians to understand what his death meant and why he died. And so he chooses the Passover as a way of, of, of as a timing for his crucifixion so that the, mis the meaning of it would be unmistakable. So if we want to understand the cross of Christ, a big part of that, a key, not just the key, but a key to understanding the cross of Christ is to understand the Passover. So we're going to come back to Luke 22, but before we do, I want to spend a moment looking at Exodus 12, reading through God's initial instructions for the observance of the Passover when the initial Passover happened. So back in Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse 3, this is what it says. The Lord speaking, he says, Tell the whole community of Israel... That on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at midnight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the, of the houses where they are to eat the lambs. This blood is going to be marking their homes, the blood of the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and the staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Supper. He's painting this picture of be ready to go in a moment. You're, you're, not, you're not staying for a while. You're ready to run. Get, have your sneakers on because you're going to bolt. And verse 12, On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This powerful image, the last of the plagues that the Lord sent on Egypt, uh, convincing Pharaoh to release the Hebrew slaves from slavery in Egypt. It's the last one. It's the most serious. It's the, most, it's the heaviest of all of them. There are plagues of gnats and plagues of frogs and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of silly, but this one is not silly at all. This one is serious and sober, the plague of the firstborns. And there's the blood on the doorposts of the house. And there's all this symbolism of the meal. There's the initial act of the Passover. And then there is this annual celebration, this annual remembrance of the meal. And the meal would look something like this. This is the, a dish that would be at the Passover Seder. 
And there's symbolism here. There's a lamb shank, which is representing the Passover offering, and there's a roasted egg. They'd roast the egg, and that's a symbol of their new birth coming out of slavery. There's bitter herbs, which would evoke the senses in the sense of the, bit, the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt. And there's a bitter vegetable and a non-bitter vegetable, and then there's the unleavened bread because they were to have no yeast in their home through that festival of unleavened bread. And then there's a combination of nuts and apples, which represent the bricks that they were making in their bondage in, in slavery in Egypt. And then there were four cups of wine, which also had their own unique symbolism. And they would remember this meal every year, and they still do to this day. Every year, remember this feast and celebrate this meal together as a, as a way of remembering the bitterness of their slavery and how God reached down and pulled them out of their slavery in Egypt and delivered them and set them free. And there's a really, really interesting part of the symbolism here is number four, that Christ's crucifixion coincided with the slaughter of the Passover lambs. There's some people who think that as he was hanging on the cross, dying on the cross, that that's the very moment when the Passover lambs would have been slaughtered. And other people say maybe it wasn't the exact timing, but the, coinc the coinciding of these two events, it was so clear that this was an intentional timing of both Christ and the Father to have his crucifixion come so close to the timing of the slaughter of the Passover lambs because of that line, the blood will be a sign for you. In the same way that their blood, the blood of the lambs covered the doorposts of their houses and they celebrated this meal together, this is a special meal. This is a sacred meal. Reminds me of a friend of mine named Joel. He's a pastor in Vermont. A few years ago, he asked me to come and uh, speak at his church, which was a, a real honor. And uh, after I was done speaking, he got up and led the church through communion. And I'll never forget the way he set up communion. He said, uh, he told the story about a, somebody he knew who had been in foster care as a kid and uh, there had some, some malnourishment as a result of their, their upbringing. And when they entered this foster care home, this foster home, uh, this foster mother uh, prepared special food to get, help this child get caught up, prepared a special diet because they recognized the malnourishment and the, the unique needs this child had because of their, their past, and so prepared a special diet to help them get caught up. And he said, this meal, Passover, the, the Lord's Supper, is a special diet prepared by a loving Father for us, recognizing the deficits we have, the spiritual malnourishment that we have, and the need we have to get that straightened out. And that's just, I love that picture of, of this meal, the Lord's Supper and Passover being the special diet prepared for us by a loving Father. I reached out to him this week and I said, do you remember saying that? I, I remember that so clearly. I thought that was such a beautiful picture of communion and said, do you remember saying that? And he said, honestly, I don't remember saying it. <laughs> I can't believe you do. But he said, I know exactly who I was talking about. He said, I was talking about my wife, Christine. He said, she grew up in foster care. And her foster mother, when, when she came into the home, uh, in addition to the meals they ate as a family, prepared a special diet for her to get her caught up because of her malnourishment. And he said that special attention and that special diet did as much for her body as it did for her soul. This is a special diet prepared for us. A special meal laid out by a loving father who knows the deep needs of our souls more than we can possibly dream or imagine. And Jesus comes to this Passover supper. He instructs his disciples to prepare it. Now they gather for this Passover supper, and he's trying to use this as a lens through which we can understand his crucifixion, as a way to help us to understand in advance what his crucifixion on the cross means and the, the full ramifications of this. And this is what he says in verse 14 of Luke 22. When the hour came, Jesus and his, disciples, and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He comes to this meal, and all the times he celebrated all of his life, at probably at least three times with the disciples as he observed this Passover meal with them, and now it's the last time he says, I will never enjoy this meal again until it comes into its fulfillment. This is a critical, critical moment. And part of what he's trying to describe to them is number five, that the cross was a trap set for death itself. We think about what the cross was. This was not a trap set for Jesus to capture Jesus. It was a trap for death itself. 
There are all sorts of, of books that have been written and countless books have been written explaining why Christ died and what it meant for us and how it works and theories of atonement that try to explain how it works. And there's a range of theories of atonement that are considered orthodox. There are some of these that I'm, I tend to be more in line with and others that I think are kind of grotesque, but they're still within the, the, what's considered orthodox Christianity. There are some that are outside of that. Today, I want to share one, of, one with you that I've dubbed the men in black theory of atonement. If you know this movie, The Men in Black from, uh, not The Men in Black, Men in Black from 1997, I was greatly disturbed this weekend when I realized that this movie is older than some of the folks on our church staff. Uh, I don't know if it's quite a classic, but it's at least been, or at least it's apparently old at this point. Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith, they are agents, Agents K and Agent J, I believe, and their task is to find aliens who've infiltrated planet Earth and to, to root them out and take care of it. And uh, in the climax of the movie, there is this giant caterpillar bug-looking thing with giant mandibles, and they're trying to defeat this giant bug-looking thing. I really, really wanted to show you the clip of this movie, but because of live streaming and licensing stuff, we can't show it. And I wanted to show you just a still shot of the bug, but it's so scary. I didn't want to scare the little kids among us or the middle-aged dads. So instead... <laughs> This is a picture of a Dobson fly that exists. These live in painted posts. They live in this area. I've seen one here last summer. I saw one for the first time. I nearly, I may or may not have screamed when I saw it. Uh, they're about the size of your hand. They're bi apparently they're harmless, but they're creepy looking. This is kind of, take that thing down. It's giving me the creeps. This is kind of what the bug in Men in Black looks like. This awful bug that they're trying to, to defeat. And while they're, they're taunting me by leaving up longer. That's... <laughs> That I love our team. <laughs> and, and this is the kind of bug that they're trying to defeat at the climax of this movie. And as soon as the battle ensues, the first thing the bug does is disarms Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith, eats their guns. Well, now what? <laughs> when you're watching the scene unfold and you put yourself in their shoes, what do you do when your task is to fight this giant, creepy-looking, disgusting thing, and the first thing it does is take away your guns? Well, Tommy Lee Jones' character, Agent K, begins to taunt the beast. And he starts calling out at it and waving his arms at it and calling out and taunting the thing. And next thing you know, the big beast swallows him whole. And Will Smith, Agent J, is like, first you eat my gun, now you eat my friend. <laughs> what else are you going to eat? And the battle ensues. But what the bug thinks is that he's defeated his enemy. But inside the belly of the giant Dobson fly-looking beast, uh, Agent K has re retained his gun. He's gotten his gun back, and he just defeats the beast from the inside. From within the belly of the beast, he wasn't getting devoured by the, the beast. He was setting a trap for the beast. He was the trap, and he knew that if he could just get back inside, he could get his gun and destroy the beast from the inside. That's part of what Jesus has done. They thought they set up the cross, that they had set a trap for Jesus, but Jesus had set a trap for the powers of darkness. This is very similar to what happens in the Chronicles of Narnia, when Aslan finds that the white witch is going to, to kill uh, Edmund, the treacherous little boy, for his lying, for his cheatery. And cheatery, that's a word that, that has been my vocabulary, if you've never heard that before. I didn't mean to let that slip out. Uh, that comes from my hi high school swimming coach. Cheatery, that's... Ed, Edmund was guilty of cheatery, and, and Aslan intervenes. He offers himself up in, in the stead of, of Edmund. And he offers to pay the price that Edmund was going to pay. And the white witch thinks, this is an incredible trade for me and an awful trade for you. Why would you, the great Aslan, take the place of this measly little lying child named Edmund? This is ridiculous that you would take this place. And so she slays Aslan. And her and all of her evil minions rejoice that they have conquered Aslan. They've conquered the great lion. Now they will have the run of the whole kingdom. Little do they know that Aslan comes back to life. The stone table is broken. And this is what Aslan says in the words of C.S. Lewis. If a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backward. It was a trap, not for Aslan. It was a trap for the white witch and for all the powers of darkness. In the same way that Agent K was the bait for the trap for the big heinous beast, in the same way that, that Aslan was the bait in the trap to get the white witch and all her evil minions to, to fall into the trap, to conquer them once and for all, Jesus, when he spread his arms on the cross, he was not trapped. He was the bait in the trap to undo all the powers of darkness. Which leads to our last question. Who killed Jesus? We did. And he led us but God raised him. 
We did. And he led us. But God raised him back. When you read through the story, it is tempting to want to point the finger at somebody and to figure out who was ultimately, who was ultimately to blame for his crucifixion. Was it Judas for betraying him? Was it Peter for denying him? Was it the disciples for abandoning him? Was it the chief priests for questioning him? Was it Pilate for washing his hands of him? Was it Herod for questioning him? Was it the crowds for chanting for him? Was it the crowds for chanting crucify him? Was it the soldiers who flogged him, who pierced him, who put a crown of thorns on him, who drove the nails into him, who crucified him? Was it the thieves who mocked him? Was it the onlookers who jeered him? No. The Bible is absolutely clear that it was not Peter who killed Jesus. It was not God who killed Jesus. It was not Judas who killed Jesus. Caesar didn't kill him. Pilate didn't kill him. Rome didn't kill him. Albany didn't kill him. Washington didn't kill him. It wasn't the Democrats or the Republicans or the atheists who killed him. It was me. I did it. We did it. It's our fault. And the miracle of miracles, the most astounding twist in the whole story, is he led us. At any point, he could have said, enough is enough. At any point, he could have just thrown up his hand and it would have been over. At any point, he could have said, don't you know who I am? At any point, he could have said, who do you think you are? At any point, he could have called and a legion of angels would have come to his rescue, but he let them. He let them mock him. He let them persecute him. He let them jeer him. He let them arrest him and betray him. He didn't have to, but he did. And the powers of darkness rejoiced. The powers of darkness rejoiced and, and, and giggled and laughed at the sheer delight of the fact that they had trapped the Son of God, that they had killed the author of life, and now they could run amok. Now they could have their way with all of creation. Now they could have their way with all of the universe, but it was a trap. He had set a trap for them, and he broke death. In the words of C.S. Lewis, we are told that Christ was killed for us, that his death has washed out our sins, and that by dying, he disabled death death itself. That's the formula. That is Christianity. That is what has to be believed. That this idea that by dying, death itself has been broken. It's never worked the same sense. It was a trap for death and all the powers of darkness. As Peter said in Acts chapter 2, Jesus of Nazareth was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. They thought they had killed him. They thought they had sealed the grave, but death could not hold him down. Evil could not hold him down. The powers of darkness, all joining their forces together, could not hold him down. And when we look at this through the lens of Passover, we know this is one great rescue mission for God, another great rescue mission from God, that in the same way back at the Passover, for a particular group of people at a particular point in history, in a particular place, God had rescued them from the worst of the worst. Now, for everyone, everywhere, at all times, for all those who will believe, he has performed the greatest rescue mission of all and broken death from the inside, the death of Christ disabled, death. The sufferings of Christ sabotages the enterprises of evils. The cross crushed the forces of evil, and the cry of our heart has to be, all hail King Jesus. Amen. Crown him. Crown him with many crowns. The lamb upon the throne. Awake my soul and sing of him who died for me and hail him as thy matchless king for all eternity and he shall reign forever and ever. At the Passover feast, the host, the head of the family or the host of the meal would always say particular words of institution, recount their plight in Egypt. Remember their slavery. Remember their bondage, the bitterness of their slavery in Egypt as they were sharing this meal together. And the disciples all around that table would have been waiting for Jesus to say those words. But he didn't. This is what he said instead. Verse 19, he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it, gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's how we're going to close our time this morning in just a few moments, partaking of this meal, which is a special diet prepared by a loving Father who knows the deep needs of your soul, where we remember and proclaim Christ's suffering, where we trust that he's meeting with us as we partake in this together. In a few moments, uh, the band is going to lead us in a moment of reflection. We can prepare our hearts to come to the table together. And I'll come back up and lead us through this. You don't have to be a member of Victory to partake in this. If your desire is to, to draw close to the Lord, if you've given your heart to Jesus, it is his invitation extended to you to receive this meal together. Special diet prepared out of the Father's love for you. And as we get ready, let me uh, pray for us in preparation. Lord, whatever was our gain before, we counted as loss. All the things we thought we had going for us, rubbish. Worthless compared to the joy and the prize of knowing you. Lord, we want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And so to attain something like joining with him in the fellowship of his sufferings and to attain the resurrection from the dead. Make it our testimony, Lord, that we can say, I have been crucified with Christ, that we have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And this morning, maybe if you would say, you've been living in half measures or half-hearted discipleship, straddle in the fence or maybe not even getting close to the fence because you know the, the call to discipleship that's waiting on the other side of that fence and you're ready to jump in you just pray with me I surrender all no half measures no holding back I give it all to you take me mold me transform me. I've tried to wash away my sin with time, with good deeds, with trying really hard to try really hard to be good and none of it's worked, Lord. I need blood. Would you wash me clean with your blood? May the cry of my heart be all hail, my Lord, my King, my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. One more word. I just want to say one thing. If, in particular to those of you who may be feeling particularly unworthy to receive this meal, it's kind of the point. If you feel like you've messed up, maybe you've gone too far, you're in too deep, it's for you. All of us who've messed up too much, all of us who are in too deep, all of us who've sullied our hands, all of us who've, who've tarnished our lives, he says, my body, broken for you, my blood, poured out for you. Not if you're good enough, not if you have done things just right. No, his only words of instruction were, take and eat. Let's prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper together.